I welcome you all on the second day of webinar on clinical updates in the management of genitourinary cancer revisit ESCOGU 2022. And with immense pleasure, I would like to invite Dr. Chandra Goda, who is Associate Director, Medical Oncology, BLK Super Specialty Hospital, Delhi, for welcome and introductory note and to set the ball rolling. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, today is the second day of uh, CME. So and we today will be mainly covering the urinary bladder cancer and some uh, sponsor talks for uh, HCC and RNA cell carcinoma. And uh, we all have covered exhaustively yesterday and uh, very nice talks uh, we heard as far as the renal cell carcinoma and uh, the bladder cancers are concerned. So uh, without wasting much of a time, I would uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Venkat, who is a great academician and has written books at this uh, young age so uh, to, to, to start the next talk on what, is, what you can plan in New York joint MIBC. So uh, uh, over to you, Dr. Venkat. You are muted. So I am unable to share my slide deck. I am uh, logging out and logging in again in a moment. Just give me a moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Thank you for the kind introduction, sir. Uh, so, uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to meet and learn. So, today, my topic is to discuss on ideal neoadjuvant therapy in muscle invasive bladder cancer. So, let us see what is the standard of care as well as what are the advances that are going in this field in this next 15 minutes. We have no, we know that in the muscle invasive urinary bladder cancer, there is a high risk of recurrence with surgical treatment alone. We know the standard of surgery is radical cystectomy. However, the relapse rate is quite high to the tune of 30 to 50% in various studies. So it has been standard of care to give perioperative chemotherapy and mostly neoadjuvant chemotherapy in this setting, who are all fit for the radical cystectomy. So it is seen that the response rate to the new adjuvant chemotherapy is due to the tune of 40 to 60%, and there's a 15 month overall survival with a cisplatin based chemotherapy in this subset of muscle invasive urinary bladder cancer. We know the, uh, the muscle invasive bladder cancer, it starts from stage two and extends the spectrum extends up to stage four A. When we see the uh, uh, imaging uh, and evaluation of the muscle invasive bladder cancer, it starts with transurethral dissection of bladder tumor, along with cystoscopy to see the concurrent lesions, along with the imaging of chest, abdomen, as well as pelvis. When the it is stage two, the ideal treatment is cystectomy, and all those candidates who are fit for radical cystectomy has to undergo neoadjuvant cystatin-based chemotherapy if they are eligible for that therapy. However, it is a radical procedure and a lot of lifestyle changes do incur after cystectomy. So in those patients who are not willing or who are not suitable for cisplatin-based chemotherapy are not suitable for cystectomy, they undergo usually a, a triple modality treatment of chemotherapy, radiotherapy in a concurrent setting as well as partial cystectomy to save the bladder in majority of the cases. In stage 3A, a similar paradigm is followed as in stage 2. However, in stage 3B, where the relapse rate goes on to the much higher rate, recently, based upon Checkmate 274 trial, 274 trial, from the August 2021, FDA has approved an immune checkpoint inhibitor in the adjuvant setting, that is nivolumab, to reduce the rate of recurrence. 
In stage four A, the same adjuvant, the uh, same approval applies to. We can clearly see here from this publication, which was done very long ago in 2003 in NEJM, uh, in patients who underwent surgery alone versus patients who have taken the neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy, the survival rate is grossly separated, and this is much more pronounced between two and three years after the treatment. So, how did this choice of cisplatin based neoadjuvant chemotherapy does evolve? So it is based upon a meta-analysis, which has included 11 randomized clinical trials with about three, more than 3,000 patients. The endpoints of this uh, meta-analysis is oral survival and disease-free survival. And it has included all the platinum-based combinations, including single and platinum. And when we see the hazard rates here, hazard ratios here, anywhere it is extending between 0.75 to 0.86, most of the clinical trials showing the benefit in favor of platinum-based combination, implying that nearly one-fourth to one-fifth of the patients they are saved from the progression events or the death events by giving this platinum-based chemotherapy. So after the meta-analysis, it is concluded that neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it produces pathological complete response rates of to the tune of 35 to 40%. And those patients who have achieved pathological complete response, they have significantly five-year uh, overall survival higher than those who are not achieving the PCR. And the difference is to the tune of 35% at five years. So we can say that platinum-based combinations, this demonstrate significant overall survival and PFS, and uh, that is DFS benefit in a given setting with 5% benefit in OS and 9% benefit in DFS at five-year landmark. But in reality, in the uh, typical clinical setting, we know that majority of the patients, due to the age at which bladder cancer manifests, due to the comorbidities that accompany the age, many of them are, may not be suitable for cystectomy or cisplatin. So there is no fixed criteria to determine who are all ineligible for cystectomy. But those patients, to be eligible for cystectomy, they should have a uh, good uh, functional status good cognitive status, and they should be able to manage their medical comorbidities well in control. So any end organ dysfunction, they'll become ineligible, particularly renal dysfunction, they become ineligible for cystectomy. For cisplatin ineligibility criteria, there is criteria called Galsky criteria, which mentions that patient who is having performance status two or more, creatine clearance less than 60 ml per minute, and grade two or more audiometric hearing loss, which means uh, to measure this grade two CTCAE audiometric hearing loss, we need to order for a audiogram. And in the audiogram, if there is greater than 25 decibels shift in the two consecutive uh, frequencies tested, then it is regarded as grade two audiometric loss. Anything which is uh, 25 decibel shift or more than that, then it is considered as a grade two audiometric hearing loss. In those patients, and those with peripheral neuropathy, grade two or more, which means the patient is having symptoms and also having problems managing his instrumental activities of daily living, IADL. So those patients, they'll become ineligible for cisplatin. And we know that nearly more than uh, up to 50% of patients, they will not be eligible for cisplatin because of this criteria. And of course, heart failure is the one thing we need to take care uh, if it is Niha class C failure or more, the patient become ineligible because of the hydration we need to give for cisplatin. So in these patients, if we give cisplatin, although patient is, is able to take it on an acute basis, but the benefits on the long term will be lesser than the toxicity by this cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Uh, the problem for the clinician is that there is no standard neoadjuvant therapy in cisplatin eligible ineligible patients like uh, where in ovary and lung cancer patient, we can comfortably shift the patient onto carboplatin-based regimens, but there is no such criteria or practice uh, in neoadjuvant setting in urinary bladder cancer. So this is one of the landmark study uh, in urinary bladder medial invasive cancer in non-metastatic bladder cancer. It is a French trial, multi-center phase T trial. It is done to test whether a less intensive regimen will achieve the same results as dose-dense MVAC regimen, which has been the standard of care. We know that 
there are two types of MVAC regimens that are available, classical MVAC and dose-dense MVAC. Classical MVAC is given every 28 days, uh, dose-dense MVAC is given every 14 days, that is every two weeks. So this trial looked at whether dose-dense MVAC uh, can, uh, dose-dense MVAC and uh, this uh, gemsis regimen can yield the same results as dose-dense MVAC when given in the near event setting. The primary endpoint is PFS at three years. When we see the results in the intention to treat population, the results are not really significant, making GC as one of the options. However, when we see the organ confined response in the patients who have achieved less than T3, pathological T3 N0, the higher rate of responses are seen with dose dense MVAC compared to the GC. And also recent evidence also shows that three year PFS is definitely better with dose dense MVAC than GC in terms of PFS. So in those patients who are eligible, who are fit, particularly in those nodal involvement, dose dense MVAC is still the preferred regimen um, compared to GC. However, in a patients who have a borderline PS, maybe GC is still an option. So apart from the chemotherapy, do we have other options? Because it is era of immunotherapy, we know that immunotherapy has seeped into the bladder cancer scenario quite a long time ago in the form of map. however, it is withdrawn for uh, pembrolizumab, etc. But some of the uh, drugs have been withdrawn for the uh, trial outcomes. But is there a role in the new event setting for these checkpoint inhibitors? So these are the, this table indicates all the trials in various combinations as a single agent in combination with, uh, as a dual agent in combination with chemotherapy. Let us see briefly about the, these ongoing trials because these are going to be standard of care in the future. So how can we integrate CPIs into the muscle invasive bladder cancer treatment? It can be by using them as single agents or doublets or by combining with chemo. And they can be used in the new event, uh, followed, by, uh, followed by surgery, new event setting, perioperative setting, and adjuvant setting, as well as in those patients who want their bladder to be spared from radical cystectomy also. Let us see the trials that are testing a single agent checkpoint inhibitors in the neoadjuvant setting. There are two trials testing in the setting, atezolizumab in Abacus trial, pembrolizumab in pure zero one trial. The primary endpoint is pathological CR in both the trials followed by cystectomy. When you see the interim results, the final results are not yet announced. The median event free survival rate is not achieved in intention to treat it, uh, intention to treat cohort in the pure one trial, which is really good. And we can see here that one year EFS is 84.5%, which is really uh, hopeful. In the Abacus trial, pathological response to new event at at one year RFS is 79%, which is also comparable to the chemotherapy. These are the trials which are checking for the CPI doublet, checkpoint in beta doublets, ep nevo combination, and the pathological response rates are to the tune of 46%, and durva tremolumab combination, 35%, does what Remy for only two cycles, 37%. So this is the next set of trials, which are looking at a combination of chemo plus CPI in the near event setting. And we can see here uh, the chemotherapy regimens that were tried are the less intensive regimens like GEMSIS in almost all the trials are GEM single agent also. And pathological response rates, they're uh, almost always greater than 40% to the up to 50%. So these are the two trials which we uh, which need a special mention, which are using the chemo plus CPI in the phase three setting. One is Niagara trial, two is Energy trial. In the Niagara trial, the agent used is Dizvalmab plus chemotherapy. And once the uh, uh, surgery is done, adjuvant Dizvalmab is given. In the Energy trial, there is one more new uh, therapy, new uh, checkpoint inhibitor. In fact, it is a new new type of immunotherapy that is being tried. So in one of the arms along with the nivolumab, the IDO inhibitor, indolamine deacetylate inhibitor is being used along with the nivolumab and in the adjuvant setting, nivolumab and IDO inhibitor is being continued. The name, it is a, uh, uh, a scientific name and it is not a commercial name. So uh, with the amount of checkpoint inhibitor that is being used, so most of the medical oncologists, obviously they are concerned about the level of toxicity also. And when we can see here, it ranges anywhere between 15 to 25%. That is uh, nearly one fourth of the patient, they might have uh, grade three or more side effects. 
which is a little bit of concern definitely but with a real world experience we'll uh, we'll get to know what are the specific side effects in these settings this is one more interesting study called ev103 ev is not a electronic electric vehicle it is a n4 to map vedotin it is a multi cohort study uh, which in combination with pembrolizumab map is being tried it is in it, it is also checking for the cisplatin ineligible uh, or chemotherapy so this is really uh, a trial that can make a difference we know that n4 to map vedotin is already approved and is being used in a metastatic urinary bladder cancer so how does it act it targets it is a antibody drug conjugate it targets a, a nectin 4 it's a nectin 4 is a transmembrane protein which is involved in the cellular process associated with oncogenesis when it is inhibited the addition between the two adjacent cells is uh, uh, affected and so the cell uh, the cellular growth as well as metastasis can be progressed so whenever nectin 4 is targeted by this n4 to map vedotin there is a release of this drug called monomethyl orthostatin e and which lead to the cell cycle arrest so this is uh, looking at the pathological complete response and overall response rate in this trial and uh, it is an interesting trial because this is a chemo free reg uh, regimen which is a combination of targeted therapy and checkpoint inhibitor in cisplatin ineligible population uh, which is who are accounting for nearly 40 to 50% of a uh, population who are receiving uh, cystectomy so these are the ongoing trials For immune checkpoint inhibitor and radiation. I'm not going into details because uh, there the code names. So what we can expect in the future? What is the evolving treatment paradigm for the muscle invasive bladder cancer? We can see here whenever there is a muscle invasive bladder cancer, immune checkpoint inhibitors they may seep into the almost every setting from the uh, stage two to stage four A and. uh immune checkpoint inhibitor plus bcg might be the first option instead of only bcg and if there is a bcg under responsive we can go for the other immune checkpoint inhibitors in the second line and beyond in the near adjuvant the last minute to conclude please yeah sure so in the near adjuvant and adjuvant settings the combination of chemo and pembro which are showing a uh, really good response rates and pathological complete response rate might change and also they might seep into this population who do not want to undergo cystectomy and of course we have seen the trials testing for the population in cystatin ineligible population so in the future maybe we can better select the population to choose these costly therapies based upon the classification being given by the, the cancer genome atlas where we can get expect more than more responses by better selection of the population so to conclude cystatin based neoadjuvant chemotherapy is still the standard of care however in a patients who are cisplatin ineligible patients there is no standard chemotherapy so there comes the role of immune checkpoint inhibitors there are some questions that need to be answered what will be the long term survival data only time can answer that thank you so much for this opportunity thank you ankur uh, for a nice and lucid presentation covering all the aspects and what is going to come in the future so only one question that is in the new adjuvant setting the ivo plus chemotherapy it has not worked in the metastatic setting so including the response rate would you would that be working in new adjuvant what is your thought on that so because here anyway patient will undergo surgery so the end point is little bit different in form of pathological complete response so the combination is showing impressive uh, pcr rate so it might be the setting uh, in which it matters okay thank you So uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Bonchu, who is a colleague and uh, who is a senior consultant in medical oncology from Saket, and also uh, he's, he is he is in Gurugram, and he'll be speaking on the immunotherapy combination in the management of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is again one more interesting, uh, you know, topic in this particular scenario. Dr. Bowen, please. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you to uh, Dr. Chandrakona, uh, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'll just slide. Uh, I'll start sharing my slides. Hi. So uh, the topic given to me by is uh, I am brave one fifty, and it's basically the use of uh, atezolizumab and bevacizumab in the first line hepatocellular cancer. 
and i understand it's a generally uh, conference but then uh, uh, it's a rosh sponsored session and the slides have been provided by rosh and i am rather uh, privileged to speak about this uh, uh, you know about this uh, uh, drug doublet because i think it's the most uh, exciting era in when it comes to the io or immune checkpoint inhibitors and especially in the hepatocellular cancer when we have uh, you know it's it was more of a considered as a recalcitrant disease and now we have this exciting data with the uh, atezolizumab and i think i'll uh, you know i'll share a, a little more about it so uh, what is the rationale of combining atezolizumab and bev i think we all understand that uh, you know more more and more of malignancies especially the hepatocellular cancer uh, it is uh, there is obviously a lot of immune in, immune suppression involved in it uh, the moment there is a you know there is a uh, cancer antigen release then cancer antigens are being picked up by the dendritic cells and there they uh, that you know they are further presented to the t cells and the t cells traffic them to the uh, the t cells traffic to the tumor and then that's where they cause uh, the destruction of the tumor so why and how this came through was that uh, it was observed that there was a spontaneous regression of the tumors in the hepatocellular which possibly was carried by the carried out by the immune system and it was also seen that the tumor infiltrating t cells were found in more than 50% of the hcc patients and that's where this hypothesis that you know if you could uh, give immune checkpoint inhibitors should help in the uh, hcc and then uh, the com combination of atezolizumab was uh, made and i think there's a rationale behind it because what it has been seen that uh, bevacizumab is uh, you know it promotes uh, dendritic cell maturation it also normalizes the t cell or it normalizes the tumor vasculature thus helping uh, you know the increase infiltration of the t cells in increase infiltration of the t cells and then there is a you know uh, there is decreased activity of the immune immune suppressor by the bevacizumab and as we all know atezolizumab is a pdl1 inhibitor and it helps in uh, you know it allows the uh, it, it allows the t cells to act a little more than what it could uh, what it would normally have so uh, the that was the biochemical or that was the molecular uh, uh, the molecular rationale now this is the clinical rationale so uh, there was a first a uh, phase 1 2 trial in which atezolizumab was studied as single arm and then there was uh, you know phase 1b kind of arm in which atezolizumab was compared with atezolizumab mono there was atezolizumab arm and there was atezolizumab mono arm and there's a good amount of substantial data in atezolizumab monotherapy and that's what gave origin to the randomized phase 3 trial of im im bray 150 in the imbre 150 there was uh, obviously there were two arms uh, atezolizumab compared with the standard of care the sorafeni at that time so uh, the patients it, the uh, it was it was a well designed trial and the eligibility was that uh, the patients had to be locally advanced and metastatic unresectable hcc which most of us see uh, they should not have received any prior therapy and it kind of it was a multi center trial in uh, was present uh, that centers are present all over the world the subset analysis was macrovascular invasion and extrahepatic spread and the baseline afp were divided into less than 400 or more than 400 and the patient was, patients were randomized 2 is to 1 with the atezolizumab atezolizumab being 200 mg 3 weekly and, and bevacizumab 15 mg uh, per kg 3 weekly and sorafenib 400 mg bd so to be very frank i don't think anyone in any one of us uh, generally are able to give sorafenib 200 mg bd and i think more and more of our clinical practice has moved towards lenvatinib uh, you know 8 mg and 12 mg and to be fair i don't think we are able to give 15 uh, bev 15 also however uh, you know in in, in 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 a significant number of patients we are able to escalate to that dose and uh, the endpoints were that uh, you know uh, the primary endpoints were uh, the pfs and uh, the first the co primary endpoint was over, uh, overall survival so uh, now uh, the i am brave 150 the baseline characteristics were well matched in both the arms and if uh, you could see that uh, you know uh, there was a significant number of patients who had viral hepatitis b b h b v and h p v c and there were there were enough patients there were 30 patients with non viral hepatitis and uh, of, uh, another around 50% of the patient had received prior local therapy for hcc so uh, the efficacy results were that uh, at the end of 6 months the overall survival difference was around 13% the 6 month os rate was 85% with service 72% with sorafenib and at uh, in the first in the first analysis the median os was not reached but in the follow up study it was uh, I'll, yeah I'll, i'll just come to that in a, yeah so in a follow up study updated analysis the median os was 19.2 months with service uh, 13.4 months with the standard of care arm Which gave us a almost you know thirty six thirty four percent 
relative benefit or uh, the hazard was 0.66 and uh, the 18 month uh, overall difference was around 8 percent again the co-primary endpoints were the six months pfs rate was uh, 55 versus 37 percent with a hazard of 0.59 and it's at least by demonstrated clinical meaningful uh, clinically meaningful and statistically significant reduction in the disease in the risk of disease progression or death the updated analysis by the independent review committee was that at the end of around a year there was almost a 14 percent difference in the uh, progression free survival and i think uh, if you could look at it almost one fourth of the patients were uh, progression free at the end of one and a half year and that is something remarkable because i think most of us struggle with hepatocellular cancer uh, even in lenvatinib era we generally have patients doing well for six two months six months eight months you know max, max 10 months and then they tend to progress and uh, Dizobev, almost one fourth, that is 24 percent of the patients were PFS uh, free. Uh, the China cohort updated OS was, uh, you know, even even better with the 18 months overall survival of 56 percent versus 33 percent with the standard of care arm, with a hazard of 0.53. And if it was seen that the you know the subgroups uh, other than the BCLC stage B, which uh, you know I think uh, that is uh, in which uh, Dusra was. Uh, the standard of care of sorafenib was better. Other than that, almost all the subgroup analysis had shown that uh, you know atezolizumab is better, and I think we have also seen it in the clinical practice that uh, atezolizumab is it, it's amazingly well tolerated, and you just need to find the right patient for it. That's it. And again, the PFS benefit was also you know present in all consistent across all the subgroups. And uh, uh, what was seen was that if you look at the if you look at the overall response rates. Uh, well, you said uh, you saw only uh, twelve percent response rates in the uh, in the sorafenib arm. It was almost 20, 27 percent. And once you looked at the updated analysis, what you saw was that the overall confirmed overall response rate was almost uh, thirty, or rather, two. the CR was present in almost eight percent patients. The PR was there in twenty two percent of patients. And I think that's if I think that's a very good uh, if if you could if somebody could tell me that. You know, you would have a CR of around eight percent. With uh, other than that, if you look at the standard of care arm, it was less than one percent, or it was one percent in uh, one percent CR. I think that's 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 remarkable. And the PR was around twenty two percent in seventy two patients, as compared to seventy patients or eleven percent in the standard of care arm. And uh, the median duration of response was around eighteen months, as compared to around fifteen months. And as we understand, you know, immunotherapy is not about the first. It was also about the second PFS also, and I think that's where the uh, the absolute advantage also lies. So, as compared to the safety, uh, I I think uh, most of my experience has been pretty safe as yet, and I touched wood for that. I think it's about the right patient selection, and uh, there were hardly any uh, there are hardly any uh, uh, you know significant uh, toxicities in clinical practice. However, we need to be aware about it. So, uh, the all great toxicity was there. But then most of it was uh, most of it was grade one and grade two toxicity. I think I'll just move to the next slide because uh, this is where the uh, we looked at the individual toxicity. So I, uh, the toxicities which were of a concern was uh, there's obviously a risk of uh, hemorrhage, and then there is risk of uh, epistaxis, hypothyroidism, hypertension, and atezolizumab. However, the proteinuria is uh, uh, proteinuria is you know it's almost uh, it's it's also present in the sorafenib arm. And as we all understand that uh, the tolerance of sorafenib is very difficult and uh, palmoprenatal uh, erythrodysplasia is something which is a huge concern in sorafenib and most of our patients respond, uh, have the problem. And similar is the problem with diarrhea. Uh, so I think those were obviously higher in the sorafenib. And uh, so if you look at it, uh, so proteinuria, infusion related reactions, pruritus, fever, epistaxis, so in, in my clinical practice, what I've seen is hypertension is obviously a bit of concern and hypothyroidism is because of the immunotherapy. And uh, yes, a bit of fatigue and musculoskeletal pain does happen. And I don't think I've been using sorafenib in the recent practice. If if there is a problem, I end up using it. Then Vatinib, and which obviously the problem is uh, with the hypertension and a bit of fatigue. Uh, again, looking at the grade three, four adverse effects, uh, uh, hypertension, Altered LFTs, uh, proteinuria is what it is, and uh, I think we all are well aware of the uh, you know grade three, grade four side effects of sorafenib. Uh, now, looking at the grade three, grade five, or the you know the, or the most severest of the adverse effects, 
yes uh, i think uh, we all are scared of giving a teaser back because of the gi hemorrhage and to be very frank and fair uh, uh, that's what i have not had after out of the four five patients i have given a teaser back till now and however in the trial also three patients had uh, uh, grade 5 uh, gi hemorrhage that makes up 0.9% or 1% of it and i think other which is a little more uh, risky is obviously the the gastric ulcer perforation multiple multi organ dysfunction esophageal varices hemorrhage so all these are uh, known side effects and i think the patient should be rightly rightfully counseled about it but i think uh, if you if you could just have uh, this slide and, and the next slide so the bleeding hemorrhage uh, risk all grades is almost similar in both the arms and uh, you know the, the if you look at the grade 3 grade 4 it's 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 almost similar so if you look at the gi bleeding part of it a comparable portion of patients in sorafenib atezolizumab arm experience events under the you know they almost had the same bleeding events and the incidence of upper gi bleeding in esophageal varices were consistent with that of bev monotherapy so as you would choose it for bev so would you choose it for atezolizumab also was the message given out and uh i'll come to the slide a bit later this is the slide which i would want to uh, focus on if you look at the reflect trial versus i am brave trial the key exclusion criteria in the reflect trial were the patient had a patient who had uh, esophageal uh, gastric varices that required treatment were excluded from the reflect trial and they so if you look at the i am brave 150 the patients who were excluded obviously we are talking about child book a6 and a5 and a6 patients they were the only patients who were excluded were untreated or incompletely treated with esophageal gastric varices with bleeding or at high risk of bleeding so if whenever we are choosing patients for uh, you know atezolizumab what we need to make sure is they do not have varices who have high risk of bleeding and if they have certain varices they should be treated completely i think that's 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 about it and i think then they can be excluded they can be included in the study or in the treatment arm after that and if you look at the median duration of uh, treatment obviously it's higher in the atezolizumab arm and all risk uh, all grade high bleeding were almost similar in both the in both the trials with the lenvatinib as well as atezolizumab and i know coming to the some typical difference in the safety profile between the tkis and uh, atezolizumab so what was seen was the diarrhea was obviously lesser it was the hypertension and the uh, you know the asthenia and the and the proteinuria which was higher in the atezolizumab arm and it was diarrhea which were higher in the sorafenib arm and obviously the uh, palmoplantar erythrodysplasias so bleeding events with the systemic therapies were typically low in grade and in, in grade unrelated to the varices is what was the message out and i think it's 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 that's what mean my uh, observation also so uh, atezolizumab yes it did have higher fas taxes but if you looked at the the gi bleeding it was uh, you know it was almost similar between the sorafenib and atezolizumab uh, i hepatitis again uh, you know i have not encountered it as yet but then uh, some grade of hepatitis is known and i think it's uh, that slight elevation in the transaminases transaminases and then uh, for how were grade 3 grade 4 were uh, not that severe coming to the quality of life assessment uh, the questionnaire was given and almost finished by almost 93% of the patient until cycle 17 and more than 80% thereafter so uh, if all of us who have given sorafenib finishing it now one minute yeah yeah finishing it off so uh, all of who has given sorafenib you all understand that sorafenib just uh, you know it it's 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 a poor drug to tolerate so that was what was visible also it had it deteriorated the quality of life and that's what was it was clear through the trial now anyway the stand of care has become atezolizumab and in a person who uh, who you know uh, who was treated before this it is a, there is a clear recommendation that you know uh, there is a clear understanding that if somebody has not been approved somebody has not been given atezolizumab to begin with should be treated with atezolizumab for uh, it should be treated with atezolizumab so conclusion are uh, there is a combination of atezolizumab has demonstrated increased efficacy and uh, it should be the standard of care moving forward thank you rohan thank you for the uh, nice sir. presentation hello sir sorry yeah so uh, now we'll move on to our next one which is uh, moderation so i'll be moderating a session on uh, the metastatic dr bhuvan If yes, sir. If you can, if you can stay back. Ah, uh, sir. I request you to stay. Back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll just invite my uh, panelists, esteemed panelists, for uh, 
for a discussion on uh, the metastatic bladder cancer, the, the panel discussion. So uh, the first and foremost is Dr. Surgeon, who is the Director of Medical Oncology at PLK. Dr. Warren. Dr. Varun is there? Yes, sir. Yeah, he's a senior consultant in medical oncology at Rajiv Gandhi. Samit, I can see him. Yeah, he's, I'm there. Uh, yeah, he's a senior consultant at uh, 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 Pesham here and uh, the Action Balaji and uh, Clear's close friend and Amitabh. Dr. Amitabh is there? Uh, sir, good evening. I'm here, sir. Yeah, thank you. So he's from Tata. So, uh, now I'll uh, proceed with uh, my you know presentation. Just let me say the presentation. One second, sorry. You can see all uh, the presentation, right? Yes, sir. Of course, the uh, Bowen is also be uh, joining the same panel. So I have uh, one, uh, the seventy-four-year-old lady. So she is actually though this was. Uh, Shared uh, thing. I have one patient who is going on. I could not prepare that, and so I'm just uh, preparing this uh, this particular presenting this this case. So, 74 year old lady who is a, with a good performance status as a smoker, and there's no person or family history of cancer. She presented with the persistent back pain, painful, and frequent urination, hematuria, and weight loss. See, so underlying comorbidities were osteoarthritis and and hypertension. So, uh, so she was uh, investigated for the same. The ultimate diagnosis was, was the, the high-grade erothelial carcinoma, which is involving the muscle by 2 RBT, and her hemoglobin was 9, which was slightly low. Creatinine clearance was 75, and she is PDL1 positive. So the amazing baseline, uh, when it comes to baseline imaging, so uh, Kubaran, how do you proceed with, uh, with this particular patient? So which, which investigation you are more comfortable with? Dr. Kubaran? Yes, sir. So how Please. do you investigate? Yeah, what do you mean? So how do you, how do you proceed with this patient? So this patient, we have uh, the, the bladder cancer and has got a creatinine of 75. And uh, now how do you proceed? Would you do a PET CT scan or are you comfortable with only CT scan and a bone scan here? Okay. So um, we have both options. You can do PET scan also. You can go with CT scan and bone scan also. So, okay. Um, we, um, most of the time we do PET scan. Okay. Right. So uh, I don't want to waste time, you know, asking others. So this this was uh, a issue, uh, saying showing a multiple uh, the uh, the lung metastasis and it was a final diagnosis of erothelial carcinoma with lung and bone metastasis with the GFR of seventy five, ECOG PS one, and hemoglobin low. Uh, Dr. Amitabh, how, how will you proceed now when it comes to a treatment modality? With this scenario, how do you proceed? Uh, sir, considering he is elderly and uh, he is a diagnosed case of metastatic epithelial carcinoma with the lung and bony metastasis, mm -hmm. next step will be to assess uh, or not. You can see she is having a GFR of more than 70, and uh, you, have, you haven't mentioned regarding neuropathy. So, I can assume that she is not having any neuropathy and her cardiac functions are okay. So, in that case, she is an ideal candidate for uh, palliative intent chemotherapy with uh, either uh, gemcitabin plus cisplatin plus uh, zolidonic acid or uh, dosed as MBAC plus zolidonic acid. Would you feel she will be tolerating dosed as MBAC in this age? Uh, yes, sir, definitely, because uh, the even the tolerance of dose days versus conventional. Okay. So there's not much difference, and outcome is obviously uh, better in dose dense arm. So which one you do if you if you if you are given an option of dose dense MAC versus uh, gemcitabine in the metastatic setting, which one you prefer? So gemcis is preferred, considering okay. easier administration. Okay. So uh, Samit, is there any uh, different thoughts? If suppose. This patient is not uh, uh, platinum eligible. What what different would have done in this patient? So uh, the patient is not platinum el uh, eligible. I would go for an immunotherapy upfront for okay. this patient. Okay. And that would be either ratazumab or can be pembrolizumab. Okay. That would be my choice of therapy if the patient is platinum ineligible. Okay. So uh, surgeon there, surgeon. Yes, Chandra, uh, I'm there. So, if you uh, if you plan for immunotherapy, would you order PDL1 status in this uh, in this patient, or what's the, what's your thoughts on that? 
so um, yeah i would order pdl1 uh, for this patient but yes uh, the first choice might not really depend upon pdl1 positivity okay right so uh, bhuvan if you if you were to uh, use a, uh, the the immunotherapy versus was only a non platinum combination you have seen that a patient which one you are comfortable with immunotherapy or non platinum combination up front dr bhuvan not there so then you can take it suppose if you have been uh, asked to whether the patient is not for would you, would you are you comfortable using a non platinum chemotherapy here versus uh, immunotherapy up front so i will be more um, uh, comfortable using immunotherapy rather than a non platinum uh, uh, chemotherapy okay 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 so simply because of the tolerance or how how how, how do you place it so yeah and tolerance is one issue and apart from that i think uh, um, we don't have any other uh, um, agent which which will actually be i will be more um, as a, as a alternative to a platinum ineligible patient uh, any other chemotherapy regimen which will really work well in this situation okay 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 sir I mean, have any thoughts on combination of immunotherapy plus uh, plus chemotherapy in the first line? So, what is your thoughts on that? Sir, uh, what about carbocarbon uh, in place of cisplatin? Like, uh, we can uh, do that also or not? Sir, is this question for me, sir? Yeah, Amitabh. I mean, I mean, I'll come back to that question, Varun. Uh, what did you ask? I remember that, and I'll just come back to you later on that. So, uh, yeah, that's for you, Amitabh. Uh, yes, sir. So. Uh... so surprisingly this combination of chemo and immunotherapy has uh, failed in urothelial carcinomas in contrast to other lung cancer other carcinomas okay so obviously my choice will be either immunotherapy or chemotherapy not the combination one in this, this setting right so uh, it's uh, varun's question so why not uh, gemcitabine in carboplatin samit would you take that so would you are you comfortable using uh, the carboplatin in lieu of cisplatinum Samit, not there. Varun, how do you take it? You you, you answer question. Uh, how? Can you just repeat uh, the question? Uh, I will say. Carboplatin in lieu of cisplatin. When do you place it? I think both are equally good options. Uh, if the patient has poor uh, GFR, patient says uh, somebody who can, you cannot give enough of fluid, and uh, maybe having an ototoxicity or a neurotoxicity. So mm -hmm. I would go for a carboplatin. It's it's uh, a decent choice. Okay, thank you. So Varun, uh, where uh, other than that, where do you place it, Varun, by yourself? Yes, sir, same. Like uh, most of the time, if you can't give cisplatin, so okay. we uh, first give carb, and uh, obviously we can discuss with uh, about immunotherapy also. But we will okay. uh, not uh, uh, like uh, emphasize, you know, like uh, we first we start with jamka. Even that there is any problem in of tolerance, then we should uh, we will be go for immunotherapy. Okay, but when suppose if the GFR is uh, less than sixty and it's more than thirty, that's one more condition where you can use. Uh, you cannot use a cisplatin where you can use uh, carboplatin. And this is what we discussed. Uh, the cisplatin based. Okay, we discussed about dose dense, dose dense MAC versus gem between cisplatin and gem carbo. So uh, this all has been discussed and and, and the preferred regimen the metastatic setting would be a gem cisplatin cisplatin. For the valid reasons that we gave, and uh, so if a patient is ineligible, we also discussed about the immunotherapy at his obepemro, which was commented upon, and <clears throat> and a non immuno the non platinum combination like gemcitabine, infusion, gemcitabine, and uh, or gemcitabine taxane. This also was discussed as we know that in a patient where you use a non platinum taxane uh, or a gemcitabine combination, <coughs> sorry, responses to the tune of forty forty five percent. Which is more than the immunotherapy with uh, with overall survival around 15 months, which is almost similar to what even that's the reason why I asked you. 315 uh, so after. The patient has uh, a cost issues, so immunotherapy can, can we use a non-platinum combination upfront, as that shows almost a similar uh, similar you know uh, overall survival. So this was uh, the baseline uh, PET the, the scan of the same patient with lung nodules after six cycles of chemotherapy. We achieved a partial response. Now, after achieving a partial response post six cycle, Amita, how do you proceed with this patient? Uh, sir, since uh, she has shown a very good uh, response to initial baseline chemotherapy, and uh, considering uh, 
if finances are not a restricted to restricted factor then she is a candidate for maintenance with the evolume as okay. per the data right i think completely agree if would have no progression for example after six cycle patient has progressed so what would have been your choice Uh, Dr. Chandru, I just like to ask the um, the panelist. Yeah. Uh, yes, Sujan. I have one uh, question. Okay. So normally, uh, if it is like platinum ineligible, like uh, first thing is that we make it just platinum ineligible. But if right. the patient platinum uh, platinum ineligible and finances are not an issue, what what do uh, like what do people prefer? Because I if finances are not an issue, I will go to I will prefer a single agent immunotherapy. So do other panelists also believe the same, or they have some different opinion? Uh, start. We'll start with Abhijit. How how do you take this question? Dr. Dr. Sajan is asking where if your patient is platinum ineligible, would you give a single agent immunotherapy or a, a non-platinum combination? How do you take it? If a finances are, we'll discuss like finances not an issue. Uh, finances are an issue. Sir, just now you answered this question because uh, even if your non-platinum combination or even single agent chemotherapy, the response rate is in the tune of twenty to thirty even forty percent and. you can expect a survival of more than a year right. so um, <laughs> i'm not a strong believer of these fancy drugs so still we can start with chemotherapy and subsequently we can add immunotherapy even the ps deteriorates so that's my take because it's very difficult to use chemotherapy in subsequent line than to use chemotherapy in the first line okay uh, dr samit samit is not there so my choice in uh, platinum ineligible will be uh, immunotherapy of front mm -hmm. if the patient is non affording then i'll have to discuss with the patient probably wants with either of the drugs so that we should be discuss with the patient i think we got uh, uh, this slightly uh, divided house and sajan samit uh, they definitely i mean we have given a choice of financial not a issue uh, immunotherapy offrent is a better tolerable drug i just to put a question because we had discussed earlier as well well if if the response and everything is the same so why to uh, waste the resources after that was that was a contention to ask that question i think uh, every uh, nobody is wrong or right in this particular regard so to start the immunotherapy offrent as you have data to support it and non platinum combination because i we believe probably it is the same uh, response and survival that was the thing now uh, coming back to this if this there is a progression or a stable disease to surgeon what would you do in this uh, particular regard dr surgeon uh chandra i'm uh, there is some signal but what is the question okay. if this patient after six cycles of chemotherapy has a progressive disease so uh, in a partial response available for maintenance as we have data if the there were to be a progressive disease how do you take it uh, how do how do yeah so dr chandru like if um, because this patient has been first exposed to chemotherapy yeah. uh, which is either uh, mostly platinum based uh, chemotherapy yes gem 76 plus 6 this is platinum it's platinum or carbobatin whatever has yeah, and yeah. there is and there is a progression of disease yes so um uh, i will like to go to second line because if the patient is able to tolerate platinum then mm -hmm. we could either go to uh, kind of a cmv kind of a regimen where mm -hmm. we could give three drugs or i could also go to a single agent uh, nap paclitaxel so i will be more happy to go to a, a chemotherapy depending upon whether single agent or two or three drugs based upon the patient's performance status rather than go to immunotherapy uh, mm. also one more thing which i like to add is like uh, at that point of time i also like to have the cps score uh, mm. if the patient has got a cps score which is good then uh, probably more than 10% i'll be i'll might be in time to still use pembrolizumab because uh, these are the patient who might still respond to immunotherapy irrespective because we don't have that data with the pembro in the platinum ineligible uh, so of, of platinum patient who have responded uh, okay. so or progressive so these are two options which i which i might explore fair enough i think i, I completely agree so if a patient is progressive second line chemotherapy depending on the tolerance or immunotherapy so uh, whichever is best because what i asked with avalimab whether the patient has responded or not uh, it can also be used in even the progressive disease because we have a data on that as well so uh, in only who respond well to uh, to chemotherapy the avalimab has has seen the some uh, survival advantage so this is what we had uh, a patient who was given available uh, first line maintenance we all have cases to share
and this is what the uh, gemcitabine i don't platinum ineligible ineligible combination has resulted in the mean six months of uh, uh, response with the venerolimin uh, gemcitabine and uh, overall response rate was 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 uh, almost 63% of this combination with uh, over a year of survival survival this is one more combination of uh, gemcitabine paclitaxel the response rates of you can see 54 to 70% with survival of 13 to 6 months 16 months in in the non platinum drugs so this is one which one uh, which is just i like why we should use a maintenance avolumab in the first line instead of using probably you uh, the chemotherapy first or a progression then i mean probably that that's this is the reason why uh, why it was there so though their intertrial combination the comparison should not be made the overall you can see the this particular uh, combination has uh, better tfi uh, the, the dfi in terms of uh, the survival as well as the the pfs compared to other uh, other combination like okay. different io for a back chemo and all that so this is why the fda has approved the pembro and atezolizo with the pdl1 as as a, you know marker in the frontline setting where the platinum is not platinum you need to have as surgeon pointed out you know to have a cps scoring to to uh, uh, to to use ketruda or atezolizo so we have still an unmet need in the first uh, first line and then uh, that's when the lot of patients would would fail early now we have maintenance setting the maintenance is is, is for uh, avolumab and uh, this is how the first line second line has things have been have come up so uh, the switch therapy as was uh, as was talk, talking about and if a patient progresses on second line amitab uh, how do how how will you take it if a patient has a uh, progression on the second line Uh, is there anything that you can do uh sir theoretically yes but practically it's very difficult because two drugs are approved okay. which are anti uh, fgfr fgfr and uh, another drug which is mono antibody and chemotherapy conjugate but i don't think either of the drugs are available in india so okay. theoretically if the psc is still preserved we can try with uh, uh, either uh, any third line chemotherapy like uh, And this uh, <clears throat> vinflunin or whatever is available versus best supported care. And one more thing is afrin metastatic. If there's any FGFR patient, uh, if you do it uh, or if you send it to us, we have some uh, some trial going here. Yeah, Sajan, we have it's already on that trial is on now. Nah? The FGFR uh, in 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 early bladder cancer in the second line. Um, uh, Dr. Chandru, that trial is not still with us, but yes, very soon we'll have that trial. yeah so that's that's one thing which where we do an fgfr inhibitor uh, in the metastatic you uh, see if you have any of those patients you can uh, they can send us to us in fact uh, dr chandra i also like to add that like, this is a really fascinating era for fgfr inhibitors because for lanji also there there was a one um, uh, agent which has got approved even mm-hmm. here we got fgfr inhibitors um, approved for us so Correct. i think that that's kind of one thing which is on a really fascinating time for uh, hopefully these uh, agents come to india soon but they will get a lot of uh, in fact keras as well as fgfr inhibitors too i am really very excited absolutely absolutely so uh what what how to take the where do you place uh, enfortumab without it is it, it, it was making a lot of news and now all of a sudden i think is it is it going to stay or uh, what is the, what your take on that particular drug sir um pardon please repeat sir please enfortumab without it Sir, I have. I don't have any experience with this. Probably. I mean, nobody has it because it is it's yes, to be imported. So, so uh, still, I feel uh, because if there is no other option, and if patient is uh, this particular condition is there, then uh, obviously I would tend to use this drug in uh, these type of patients. But uh, we'll see. But our patient will tolerate it. Uh, I think in the, we have the evidence for fourth, second line where uh, patient has received prior two lines, and then. Uh, The third line you can use it. It's a good uh, drug to be you know tried, and this is the Avalin trial, which has uh, which has a survival advantage. So one of my patients initially started seven months down the line. He continues to be in complete remission. He's seventy plus years. The gem uh, carbo he, he received, and then uh, ultimately he's on maintenance. So uh, how does it matter, Doctor Ramita? If your patient uh, we are putting on available available maintenance. Uh, suppose a upfront patient has it with a gemcitabine cyst platinum or carbo does that matter or you still use it i don't think it it will matter a lot because uh, it is altogether a different drug whether 
whatever chemotherapy you are using is uh, not likely to have uh, any given the trial is gmc the data is extrapolated for approval with uh, dose and sample for any other combination of things. yeah so i think would you use in, if you have used a uh, upfront non platinum combination <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think just out of box questions. Suppose a patient achieved a response, and uh, he's in complete remission for that matter, non-platinum. Would you use yes. available maintenance or some definitely, sort of immunization? Definitely, yes, sir. Finances are not a concern, and patient is uh, ready to accept the thing that there is no data, but uh, he or she is likely to have mental benefits. Yeah, uh, this is what we have asked. So whether you use the carbo or cis platinum, the advantage is mentioned on available maintenance. I think uh, this is what we have uh, 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 done. And then uh, this also, we have already answered this question. So, uh, so post-available maintenance third line, we already discussed as uh, as as the panel was uh, talked about uh, the n 2 map and anti-FGFR and sustituzumab, which also can be used in this particular uh, line. With that, I, I come to an end of uh, this panel discussion and thank all the expert panelists for the valued time and opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'll end my uh, final discussion and move on to our next one. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, for the wasting, then I'll just move on to uh, the last two presentations that we have for today. So, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Akhil Kapoor, who is an assistant professor in medical oncology from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Varanasi, to deliver a next uh, lecture uh, uh, that is first-line maintenance treatment in locally advanced or metastatic erothelial carcinoma. So, Dr. Akhil Kapoor, please. Sir, Dr. Akhil is joining in a minute, sir. Okay. ये गाड़ी का नाम है टाटा किसे दे दें दस बार और हल्का अब आपको दे दें अभी भी दे दें एक टाइम कर पाना है कि दिन किसे बात को बोलो ये गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन So uh, we are. Uh, uh, my job is to discuss about a, a topic which has been a, a bottleneck for medical oncologists for a very long time. But now, with the development, we have got now uh, some treatment for the same. So, so definitely, um, this is a SCOG update as we are uh, all know. So definitely, uh, updated data for the survival is now available, and uh, we'll be presenting the same. Can we move to the next slide? So uh, there is this is the actually long term follow up data from the Javelin Bladder 100 trial. So this has been a, a game changer study, and it is a basically first line maintenance treatment for urothelial cancer with Avilumab. And initially, multiple approaches have been tried, but and finally, this approach has proven that use of platinum based chemotherapy in the upfront followed by use of immunotherapy with amelumab maintenance. And this is the study which was based on the overall survival endpoint and we'll see the updated data with this study. We all know uh, Tim Powell's. Powell's is a well-known um, oncologist from uh, uh, Bart's Cancer Institute and he is the first author of this. Thing. So let's move ahead. So this uh, study design is uh, very uh, simple. Uh, uh, which is somewhat different from the complex immunotherapy trials. This is based on uh, simply uh, the use of uh, chemotherapy with gemcitabin cisplatin or gemcitabin carboplatin. Both chemotherapy and the both platins were allowed either cis or carbo. And the patients who, who are unresectable or locally advanced metastatic urothelial were included in this study. And the patients uh, complete response, partial response, a stable disease with the standard treatment of four to six cycles. So uh, up to six cycles were allowed, uh, four cycles were minimum. They were, uh, after an interval of four to 10 weeks, uh, around 700 patients were enrolled in the study. One is to one randomization to receive avalumab as 
the treatment along with supportive care and rest uh, the other arm receives supportive care alone which is was considered at that time the standard of care and the patients were given treatment till uh, progressive disease or unacceptable toxicities or withdrawal by the either pi or the patient the point to note is that pdl1 positive tumors were close to 358 patients so nearly half of the patients uh, were having uh, pdl1 positive disease so we'll see uh, whether pdl1 positivity is making any difference or not and another very very important point which i wanted to highlight here is the primary endpoint of the study most of the studies are designed to address progression free survival uh, in such scenario but to the contrary here we can see the primary endpoint was overall survival so that is a very very uh, heartening to see the immunotherapy trial included all randomized patients also pdl1 positive was included uh, and primary analysis population as uh, as i told pfs and safety these are very important secondary endpoints and these were included at second stratification was uh, done as per uh, best response to first line treatment that is cr complete response versus uh, cr or pr versus stable disease and also metastatic site when initiation first line of treatment visceral versus non-visceral so these two are very important prognostic factors and these are included as stratification factor to balance the study so that it is free from any selection bias so let's see ahead um, in the next slide we'll see <coughs> so these are the results the data cutoff uh, which is the final uh, this is updated survival uh, data cutoff date was taken to june uh, 4 20, 2021 and medium follow was 38 months this is another uh, important point which should be kept in the back of mind this uh, there is a significant follow -up period of a uh, long follow -up period of 38 months and uh, this is the even you can see the confident interval are not also not very wide that means that most of the patients had very good follow -up in both the arms available as well as treatment was ongoing in 43 patients in the avalumab arm and 10 patients in the best supportive care alarm so close to 12 percent patients were on treatment and three percent patients of supportive care alone were on treatment and the most common reason for distant discontinuation as we can understand from the poor biology of the disease is uh, disease uh, uh, progression so most of the time patients progress very fast on uh, uh, splatin and caroplatin based chemotherapy and this is what we see uh, after discontinuing the treatment the uh, most of the time the disease progression is the most common reason in actually both the arms median duration of overall uh, velumab treatment was uh, close to 25 weeks and around 20 percent had received more than two years of velumab treatment so more than two years of velumab that means uh, around one fifth of patients receiving so significant benefit that is very very important to see uh, if a drug uh, is able to give more than two years of uh, follow-up uh, progression free survival with avalumab that that is clearly evident one fifth of patients are getting extraordinary benefit this is somewhat different from the other immunotherapy what happens uh, in most of the study 20 percent patient get benefit but they are getting so long-term benefit it is not always the rule of the thumb but here what is the point that uh, uh, very important to see that uh, these patients are able to receive long-term treatment more than two years of life. let's see uh, further data in the next slides and uh, these are um, very very important data so this is the primary endpoint of the study as you can see a two years data 38 percent versus 49 percent that means close to 50 percent in fact 12 percent difference in overall survival at two years and this is also sustained at three years overall survival and cutoff you can see 29.8 versus 36 percent so uh, you can see there is wide difference in the curve and this is starting as early as four months so this is uh, see you can see that uh, difference starts very early and is sustained throughout and towards the end of the study when the number of patients become very less still the difference is sustained so if you see the median pfs of 15 months versus 23.8 months so 8 months at least 8.8 months close to uh, 9 months survival difference that definitely it is like uh, close to uh, nearly uh, 1.5 times 1.75 times the survival is prolonged so that is very important and even we'll see how many patients were able to receive immunotherapy in the next line that will also come if we see the pfs 
in the overall population, two years PFS was 7% versus 23% and 5% at three years versus 16% at three years. So this is again the same story as uh, PFS, but OS is also uh, getting so significant prolongation and it is very, very statistically significant and also clinically relevant to us. Let's see uh, further data in the next slide. Uh, definitely, it helps us uh, in selecting a drug based on the food. If we see this forest plot, you can see all the points are nearly towards the left. That means in favor of avalumab. In only very selected patients where uh, numbers are very low, the curve might be uh, somewhat heavier. It can be towards the right in one curve we can see, but it doesn't make much difference. You can see that um, overall, all the points are towards the left. That confirms that all the subgroups of patients are getting benefit irrespective of uh, the, the uh, various stratification factors, whether presence of visceral disease or not, presence of GFR, even patients who are received cisplatin or caroplatin, all are getting benefit in terms of survival benefit. So this is very, very heartening to see a drug working so well, nearly all the subgroups of the patients. This is uh, actually very important for us. Let's see some further data uh, in, from the study in the next slide. And this is what you can see the complete response rates, uh, best response to first line treatment were close to 40% uh, in avalumab arm in around 27% in the BSC alone arm. Uh, and patients uh, with partial response were again 19.2% in Avalumab with BSC it was 12.8. So definitely, uh, OS best benefit you can see it is present uh, irrespective of best response to first line treatment because we sometimes get the questions from the uh, our colleagues and juniors whether the patients who are having complete response also require maintenance treatment. Yes, you can clearly see there is a definitely improvement in the survival from 26 months to 39.8 months. So what better you can achieve with a treatment uh, with avalumab, uh, with an immunotherapy drug. Even patients who have received CR with uh, chemotherapy are having significant survival benefit. Um, and this is very important. And you can see, and the maximum number of patients are in the partial response arm. That is why the data is, uh, seems to be very strong and powered for this. And it is uh, getting achieving statistical significance as well. So in the next, let's move to next slide. So, but the message is very clear that all the patients are getting benefit. If you see uh, patients who, uh, what was the further treatment which was uh, given subsequent anti-cancer therapy, this is also an important point to understand and receive that patients who were in the best supportive care alone arm, 53% patients receive pdl one inhibitor in the next line. So that means uh, this is not a chance uh, of, uh, derivative. What happens if the patient is on supportive care alone arm, most of the time, a significant number of patients will drop out and they will not be able to receive the next line of treatment. That is the main concern. And that is why we want to start the treatment before the patients uh, become so sick and uh, they progress so badly that they are offered only supportive care. But in this study, this is the benefit with avalumab maintenance. We are able to take care of that as well. And even in supportive care alone, more than 50% patients received PDL1 inhibitor and FGFR inhibitors are offered to close to 3% patients. And ongoing drugs, as I told, ongoing uh, treatment in Avalumab was close to 12%. So this is very, very uh, important for us. Let's move to next slide. So uh, to conclude, the long-term follow-up from the Javelin bladder trial with more than two years uh, in all patients follow-up, as I told, it continues to show prolonged overall survival and progression-free survival with Avalumab first-line maintenance. Uh, versus supportive care alone. And overall survival as uh, to be uh, re remembered is close to uh, 50% in the volume of at two years and it is close to 38% at in the supportive care alone, making a difference of close to 12% at two years. And two-year PFS rates were also significantly improved from 7% to close to 25%. So that is another big data. And if we are counseling the patients, such data is actually very important while we are counseling. Otherwise, uh, patients might not understand the benefit because sometimes medians are misleading in case of immunotherapy. But here, the medians are also very wide. But in some uh, immunotherapy trials, median is somewhat misleading. But uh, two-year database percentage are usually important and what we can see here two years uh, progression free survival 7% versus 23% if you are reporting to a patient mostly the patients if having uh, resources definitely will agree to the same and also as I told overall survival 
what a patients uh, receiving uh, uh, 50 more than 50 percent patient supportive care around receiving immunotherapy so don't think that subsequent treatment will alter the outcomes and it is what we are able to see and that's if we see the long-term safety data of avalumab it is a very uh, standard one around uh, 20 percent of patients receiving more than two years of treatment and a low rate of discontinuation due to treatment related adverse effects and no new safety signals were identified from this data so these results continue to uh, support the recommendation of avalumab first line maintenance as a standard of care for all patients with advanced urethral cancer that have not progressed on first line platinum based therapy so definitely the message is very loud and clear and the data is very very convincing so i think this was the la la last slide so this is uh, let's see some some uh, subgroup analysis data this is uh, in the asian patient subset this is uh, important uh, because uh, every time uh, we in the uh, trials of uh, lung cancer and other cancer we try to see how our patients have done how asian patients have done let's see the data from this uh, study this is actually a subgroup data from the same study javelin bladder 100 study from from amito et al next slide so this subgroup analysis was done uh, because around 21 percent patients were uh, asians and baseline characteristics as you can see these are also very well managed between the two groups the two treatment arms so this is a very very real and even the subgroup data for asians is also very fine next slide and uh, we uh, we are happy to see that there is a separate asian subgroup analysis which has been separately presented in the asco and it is useful again you see though definitely these are uh, smaller number of patients so uh, the data study might not be powered enough but you can clearly see the median os difference seems to be the same as in the overall population that is 18 months versus 25 months and here definitely the confidence interval will not cross uh, will cross one because the data is smaller and, uh, and the 95 percent confidence interval will be wide but still the median values help us to and understand that the overall benefit seems to be similar and if this is the pfs data again the separation is curves are wide very easily 1.9 months versus 5.6 months so it's a huge difference three three times improvement in the provision free survey next slide please so, so definitely the data is very very strong and if we see the toxicity in asian patients uh grade three or more adverse effects were seen in uh 44 percent patients versus 16 percent 16 percent patients in supportive care alone are also having grade three or grade four toxicity this is understandable because these patients will develop anemia and other uh, uh toxicities like uh, paraxia vomiting these might occur and, and definitely maximum important uh, side effects grade three four adverse effects when i will have if you see it is uh, close to 10 percent with anemia and uh, increase in amylase levels grade three is close to five percent and others are small numbers uh, grade three adverse effects are small numbers and if this is any grade adverse effects this will total uh, somehow to be somewhat high but that is uh, not making a difference in terms of clinical toxicities and adverse effect leading to death was small only 1.4 percent and let's move ahead so this again concluded that their safety is good and consistent with the overall population no new safety signals and efficacy was demonstrated in the asian subgroup as well the same data supports even in asian patients so uh, with this i think we can conclude here next slide And this is, yeah, uh, ARIES trial uh, uh, data from the ARIES study. Uh, this is a first line in PDL1 positive metastatic subgroup. Uh, this is another uh, subgroup which we wanted answer. And this is uh, subgroup analysis from the ARIES trial gave us uh, some highlights that uh, whether use of avilumab maintenance in first line PDL1 positive patients is having, uh, giving any difference. And patients who were uh, were given avalumab maintenance with 10 mg per kg and uh, well given avalumab treatment with 10 mg per kg this is first line avalumab data uh, the patients who are unable to receive uh, treatment uh, with any platinum that is the aries trial so this is a different from the, uh, uh, the trial of uh, javelin trial where it is was used as a maintenance treatment this is the first line avalumab data 
and this data is also uh, for cisplatin unfit patients and cisplatin unfit we are aware ps2 or ps2 is far less than 60 grade 2 or worse peripheral neuropathy and previous cisplatin for new adjuvant or adjuvant treatment with progression within 6 months so basically definition of cisplatin refractory disease was followed let's move ahead to find the slides and this is the primary endpoint. This is a, actually a, a phase two design. So median oral service close to 10 months after a median follow-up of nine months. And uh, patients alive at one year was again very significant, 41% with median PFS of two months. As I told, in phase two studies, immunotherapy medians might not give us the best answer. And we need to see how many patients are getting uh, survival at the particular time point. Among 71 PDL1 positive patients, the differential PDL1 expression has been evaluated by CP and the patient, 56 patients had CPS of more than 10%. And definitely the median was 13 months for patients with CPS more than 10 compared to seven months to those with CPS less than 10. So again, the role of CPS is coming when the patient is seeing first time treatment and this is not so maintenance treatment. So it's very, very important. OS difference was seen. This happens, uh, this is uh, seen with our uh, immunotherapy trial again uh, in some cases. And this is a proof of concept for the same as well. Let's move to next slide. This is the uh, waterfall plot, which helps us to estimate that uh, more than 50% patients are getting decrease in the size. So this is really important and uh, you can see the from the waterfall plot and the safety is uh, very similar from the all the trials adverse supported events in around 5% or more. Let's see uh, further. Next slide. So Yeah, so just to conclude, our uh, first line uh, uh, maintenance reported activity in patients with uh, advanced urothelial cancer unfit for platinum based treatment or a response rate of 22%, disease control rate of 43%. The ARIES trial clearly showed that patients uh, with CPS score more than 10% had maximum benefit, and but the survival difference was not so much. And patients who are unsaid decimal progresses, but uh, use of lumab led to a significant improvement in the same. So, uh, next slide. This is the LEAP1 data, first line PEMBRO, with or without lenvatinib. And uh, this trial, uh, do, I will be very brief with the same. And if you see the PEMBRO data, PEMBRO uh, addition, lenvatinib addition was tried, but there was no significant difference in terms of overall survival. And this data has a uh, significant benefit, and uh, we can uh, we can see the same. Let's move to the next slide. So this, uh, as I told, uh, addition of uh, uh, lenvatinib did not show any. Uh, anti-tumor activity, additional anti-tumor activity to PEMBRO alone. That is why this is not further being considered. So I think uh, as I'm exceeded time, I can, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akhil, for a, a nice uh, presentation. And I uh, know it is exhaustively covering the options in the in the first line maintenance and uh, uh, platinum ineligible patients. I'm beautifully elucidating the available where to use where available fits and in all patients. Now uh, the last topic of the day, and uh, I would like to invite uh, my colleague Dr. Vishek Raj, again a great academician, and uh, to take it forward uh, regarding the immunotherapy options in advanced RCC. So, Dr. Abhishek, Abhishek, please. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Uh, we are coming to the end of this uh, symposium. Congratulations on an excellent symposium, sir. <clears throat> so I will not take much of the time because, you know, uh, the Indian festival, Indian Premier League has started. So we all need to go, go back and watch those games. So I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, 
Now, are my slides visible? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, this topic has been like covered for us some colleges time and again. We have known that how uh, uh, beautifully the treatment has evolved over the past uh, ten years or so. Uh, we know that uh, we have historically read that uh, people have used drugs like interleukin two or interferon alpha in the management of advanced RCC, and uh, they used to have dismal prognosis, just dismal response rates of six to eight percent. And now we are looking at drugs. Uh, and or the combination of drugs where we are getting responses as high as 72%. So that's a big paradigm shift in the management of RCC. So here you can see that uh, <clears throat> this is the landscape of, uh, this is how the management of RCC has evolved, advanced RCC has evolved. Uh, so initially in, uh, there was sorafenib, then, then came su uh, sunitinib, pazopanib, temsirolimus, your uh, pazopanib with a non-inferiority trial, then came the usage of saxitinib in the second line. Uh, then nivolumab was the first immunotherapy drug. If you're discounting uh, interleukin-2 and interferon alpha, this was the among the newer checkpoint inhibitors. Nivolumab was the first drug approved in the second line. And now we have a plethora of a basket of choices to choose from when we are treating the, uh, we are, when we are uh, going to treat the first line treatment for uh, advanced RCC. We have a combination of uh, IUIO in the form of nivolumab, ipilimumab, and then we have pembrolizumab, abcitinib, and uh, uh, nivolumab, cabozantinib, and uh, uh, evolumab in combination with abcitinib. So these are some of the pivotal trials uh, that have uh, come to define the current landscape of treatment of uh, uh, advanced RCC. So, so so this is the trial compares. So we know that Sutent has been a uh, standard of care for advanced RCC after the usage of uh, IL-2, high-dose IL-2 and uh, interferon alpha. So Pazopanib uh, came into picture with this non-inferiority trial called COMPARS. So here it was shown that the, the median PFS was the same in both the arms as well as the survival with a better tolerability and better quality of life. Then uh, we also have data for uh, uh, bevacizumab plus interferon alpha, but uh, I guess I'll skip this because nobody really uses it now. Uh, then we have data for uh, cabozantinib in first line. Uh, this was the landmark cabozant trial where it was used in IMDC intermediate and poor risk. And the comparator arm was sunatinib, which showed that uh, not only uh, overall response rate, but also median PFS was better as compared to uh, sunatinib. Uh, then uh, there is... A, the data for tensorilimus in the first line. And then uh, this was the IOIO combination trial, Checkmate, the landmark Check, Checkmate 214 trial, where uh, a combination of Nevo EP was used in the intermediate and poor risk. And the comparator arm was the standard of care sunitinib, where the uh, response rates was greater, CR rates were greater. And so was the median PFS and overall survival. So uh, the the different uh, immuno-oncology strategies in uh, first-line treatment of uh, uh, RCC is a combination of IO-IO, which is nivolumab and ipilimumab, and then there is a combination of IO plus TKI. Uh, so the various trials are your javelin renal 101 trial, which uh, combined avalumab plus axitinib, and the comparator arm was sunitinib in almost all the uh, all these studies. Then keynote 4, four to 6, uh, after the uh, combination of nivo ep this was the uh, second trial which got uh, FDA approval. This was uh, this tested the combination of pembrolizumab, axitinib. Then we have uh, mo most recently nivolumab and cabozantinib, and uh, then lenvatinib, pembrolizumab. Uh, this this was the clear trial where three arms were compared: lenvatinib, evrolimus, lenvatinib, pembrolizumab, and sunitinib. So uh, we'll most mostly we focusing on the javelin trial and some of the. Uh, uh, some of the more intricate aspects of that trial. So uh, here we can see that uh, we are comparing the two trials, this Checkmate 214 and Javelin Renal 101 trial. So in the uh, in the combination IO arm, we can see that there is the, this uh, PFS suppression is happening quite late. While in the Javelin Renal 101 arm, uh, the, the, the curves of the two are separating very early. So uh, as, as less as uh, two months, with a median PFS of Avalumab plus Exitinib was 13.3 months versus eight months in the Sunitinib. Um, so uh, there you can uh, make a conscious decision that if the patient has a very high tumor burden with a with a risk for uh, uh, with a risk for early deterioration and uh, it is something where you'd want a good response rate and early response rates 
uh, because Dr. Akhil was uh, initially mentioning that uh, a lot of patients are such that they're not able to uh, tolerate therapy or they're not fit enough to receive the second line therapy. So that can happen here that if the patient deteriorates very early or you might not be, it might not give us chance to introduce TKI in such patients. So there probably you can use this uh, combination of IO plus TKI where early separation of the PFS curve is happening. So uh, apart from that, uh, we also have to go with the right TKI selection. So how to select the TKI? It is, it is not just uh, uh, in Indian scenario, uh, cost used to be a big factor, but now that uh, we have generics available for almost all of these three drugs uh, with a relatively affordable uh, costing now. So uh, that thing has gone out the door and uh, uh, we mostly focus on the toxicity, quality of life, the ability to maintain dose intensity. That is where probably uh, exitinib comes into picture that out of the three drugs that uh, we are using, if we are using in the uh, recommended dosage, in the various trials, I think axetinib is probably the one associated with the best quality of life, the least uh, side effects and the least discontinuation rates. So uh, axetinib is an ideal TKI uh, because it has a selective and potent VEGF inhibition. So less off-target inhibitions and less side effects. And uh, this label dose is 5 MGBD and uh, a lot of patients are able to tolerate. And in, in case of any combined toxicity, the uh, half-life of uh, axetinib is much short. So if you're stopping the drug and if you find that, okay, the patient is improving, so you'll probably attribute it to axetinib rather than the IOR. So you can, you can see here, here uh, how uh, some of the side effects are quite common, like for TKI and these checkpoint inhibitors, hepatitis can be common, diarrhea can be common, hyperthyroidism can be common, arthritis and rash, and some of the unique toxicity we already know. So you can see the half-life of axetinib is 2.5 to 6 hours, while for cabozantinib, lenvatinib, and sunitinib, it is quite high. So uh, axetinib reaches a stable level in the blood within 2 to 3 days of the initial dose. Due to short half-life of axetinib, the plasma concentration rapidly decreases following treatment interruption. It's a very highly selective uh, TKI with uh, relatively fewer off-target tar threats. It mostly works on the VHFR1, VHFR2, and 3. While sunitinib, cabozantinib, lenvatinib, uh, they work on other uh, uh, receptors as well. And that is why there are more side effects to those drugs. So this is the Javelin Renal 101 trial. This is a trial design. So they included uh, treatment naive advanced RCC patients with clear cell components. So they only included the patients who had clear cell histology. And uh, they, uh, these, uh, these were good performance status patients and they were uh, randomized to Avalumab 10 mg per kg IV to 2 weekly plus Axetinib 5 mg in the standard dose, 5 mg twice daily. Because compared to the standard dosing of the Sunitinib and the primary endpoints were the progression-free survival and overall survival in patients with pdl one positive tumors and key secondary endpoints were PFS and OS in the overall uh, population. And additional secondary endpoints for overall response rates, time to response, duration of response, and safety. So if we if we look at the uh, PFS in the intention to treat population, so this was 13.3 months versus 8 months in patients uh, who had uh, uh, advanced RCC, while uh, OS, was, OS data was still not reached. Uh, and this is the PFS2. So PFS2 is basically, it is the time from date of randomization to the discontinuation of second line treatment or death from any cause, whichever occurs first. So in this, PFS2 was also significantly increased and there was a 45% reduction in the uh, risk of disease progression or death. So uh, early introduction of Evalumab also continued to confer benefit even when the patient had progressed and had uh, been started on the second line. So uh, improvement in PFS2 is uh, is a good endpoint and you can see this waterfall uh, plot you can see that there is a overall response rates that is your CR and PR is as high as 52.5 percent while a significant majority of patients uh, demonstrated at least some degree of tumor reduction while in sunitinib arm it was just 27.3 percent and the the response was also faster the median time to response with Vivencio and Axetinib was 2.7 months, while in Sunitinib Amam it was 4 months. Uh, you can also see that uh, probably the side effects, uh, the, the rate of side effects, uh, the various grades of side effects was, was almost similar and uh, there was no uh, new alarms that were raised in uh, combination arm. 
so this is uh, these are some of the key points that the patient had a longer median pfs with a con consistent pfs benefit and benefits to, uh, in the subgroup analysis ben benefit was uh, uh, seen in uh, all the subgroups irrespective of, uh, based on the pdl status and all prognostic risk factor uh, response rates was uh, better as well as it was faster and there was a lower discontinuation rates and uh, high, the corticosteroid used to manage the um, uh, side effects was also lesser so this is the overall survival cross trial comparison uh, you can see that uh, most of these io arms are uh, doing slightly better as compared to the sunitinib uh, arms uh, although a cross trial comparison should not be made but uh, the, uh, here is uh, something we talk, we'll talk about safety uh, of the doublet arm in various trials so you can see that uh, uh, in the javelin arm, the rate of steroid use, high dose steroid use was 11.1%, while in Nevo EP arm was very high. We know that the combination, uh, combination IO therapy generally is associated with much more severe uh, immune related adverse events. So the uh, rate of steroid use is much higher. Even in Nevo Cabo arm or the pembrolizumab axetinib arm, the usage of steroid was higher. Even the discontinuation rates were just 3.5% uh, uh, of either drug was just 3.5% and then uh, pembroacetinib was also 6.3%. Uh, the discontinuation rates were um, uh, much higher in patients who were treated with nivolumab cabozantinib. Uh, the reason being cabozantinib is uh, quite toxic. It is associated with a lot of, lot of side effects. Same goes for lenvatinib, pembrolizumab. And uh, there was some degree of dose reduction that was also uh, there in all the arms. While it was uh, probably the least for pembrolizumab axetinib, uh, followed by javelin. <clears throat> so, uh, if we see the subgroup analysis of the various trials, you can see that uh, the checkmate 214, here the pa patients did not respond, the favorable group patients did not have a favorable uh, uh, hazard ratio for OS. Uh, similarly, for even for PFS, it was not there, and response rates was also. Uh, less in patients of, of favorable group uh, RCC. While in the Javelin uh, Renal 101 trial, uh, the patients, uh, even in the favorable risk groups, they, they did respond and uh, uh, there was a benefit, the beneficial uh, hazard ratio for uh, not only overall survival, but also for PFS. So uh, uh, overall response rates was also higher in all the subgroups in the uh, Javelin Renal trial. Uh, in the Keynote 426 trial, Again, uh, you can see that uh, for overall survival in the uh, favorable risk, IMDC risk, it is hazard ratio is 1.17, uh, while for PFS it is 0.76. And uh, in the in the Checkmate uh, 9ER trial, again uh, the for overall survival it has not reached significant. It is not significant while it was significant for the intermediate and poor. Uh, similarly, for PFS, uh, uh, there was si significance in all the arms. So, uh, this we have already discussed, the rates of discontinuation. So, a question often comes, like uh, we know that uh, some of these newer therapies are going to give a response rates of as high as 72%, like for uh, lenvatinib, pembrolizumab, and even for the javelin trial, we have seen that uh, response rates are 52%. But what about if the patient does not fall in that uh, category or if the patient did respond and if he did progress on uh, the first line IO, then what do you have to do uh, to treat such patients in the second line? So, uh, like after the introduction of first line immuno, immuno oncology drugs, uh, it is really a difficult decision to make for us oncologists that what next. But yeah, we, we can, we can uh, probably extrapolate the results of other trials or some of the previous trials of cabozantinib, axetinib, and uh, we can make a conscious decision based on the patient's performance status, the patient's comorbidities, uh, um, financial status, and things like that. So the various uh, regimens avail uh, available to us are your nivolumab, nivolumab, ipilimumab, the various other IO combination, IOTKI combination, then the targeted therapies like cabozantinib, lenvatinib, evrolimus, your axetinib, evrolimus, pazopanib, sunitinib, and tivozanib. So uh, this is some of the pivotal randomized trials in clear cell RCC, which, which have progressed post-TKI therapy. So we have uh, some of the uh, 
uh, better responses have been seen in, in, in the Meteor trial, which compared cabozantinib versus Evrolimus. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, the second line or beyond, it had a better response rates as well as the uh, PFS was also improved as well as the OS. In the nivolumab also, um, uh, there was a significantly improved uh, overall response rates while uh, median OS was improved by almost five, five, five months. And uh, lenvatinib evrolimus combination is also, it's, it's, it's a relatively toxic combination, but uh, it does achieve a good response rates of around 43% even in the second line. And as compared to evrolimus, it is achieving a median OS of around 25 months. So this also remains a uh, in, in carefully selected patients, you can use a combination of lenmatinib evrolimus with a careful, careful, uh, carefully watching the side effects. So uh, this is the uh, PFS, PFS curves for various uh, drugs in the second line. This is the cabozantinib evrolimus, where there is a nice separation of the curves for lenvatinib evrolimus compared to the lenvatinib uh, or evrolimus. In the nivolumab, you can see that the PFS curves are not separating, but yes, uh, we know that for most IO drugs, uh, immunothera immunotherapy drugs can lead to, even if uh, fewer patients are responding, but if they continue to respond for a longer time, the OS data can show that, okay, the OS benefit is there. So now this is a phase two study. Uh, this is a Keynote 146, uh, study 111 of lenvatinib pembrolizumab after progression of, on previous IO therapy. We already have the first line data for lenvatinib pembrolizumab, but uh, this is a, uh, this is a trial where the patients have previously received uh, uh, only 22 patients had not received any previous treatment, while uh, no previous IO treatment was received in uh, 17, and around 104 patients had previously received IO treatment for RCC. And median duration of treatment uh, in in such patients were 6.8 months. So here you can see that. Uh, good number of patients have uh, uh, res responded uh, even in patients who were treatment naive i'm sorry even in the patients who were treatment naive of course the response uh, overall response rates were 72 percent while io naive patients it was 41 percent but it was uh, tki naive it was 54.8 percent so uh, lenvatinib and in combination with pembrolizumab even in patients who have pre uh, progressed on previous io based therapy could be a decent option to use in the second line treatment so there is no clear advantage of any combination. And these are some of the factors that you have to consider when you are choosing combination. Basically, what was the mechanism of action of the drug you used before and uh, the drug that you are going to use now. So, so somebody who has already been exposed to a TKI, maybe a combination, uh, maybe an IO will be a good choice. Somebody who has already been exposed to IO plus TKI, I would probably be uh, leaning towards uh, Evrolimus because it targets something else, uh, some other pathway, combination of Evrolimus plus Lenvatinib. And we, we always have to look at the toxicity profile of the patient. We have to look at the performance status and uh, efficacy and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek, for your uh, exhaustive and then very nice presentation, which is covering all the aspects of uh, RCC. So with that, we come to an end of uh, symposium from day one and the SP covered the uh, majority of the urothelial and uh, renal cell carcinoma. And uh, today was more of uh, RCC plus the urothelial carcinoma. So it was a great learning for me uh, to, to listen to all the experts and the very good uh, lectures from all of you. So uh, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart to, to, go, to, to take out time amongst the BDC, DG schedule to, to come and you know, deliver a lecture and to be a part of this symposium. Thank you, everyone. Over to uh, Horizon guys uh, for uh, for uh, the formalities. And I also thank, thank, you, the, thank you so yeah, much. Sir. I also thank the sponsors for the event, uh, all of them. So not really uh, anybody else. So to to be a part of this symposium. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and have a good night, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.